Hey everyone, happy Sunday evening to you. Today we're going to have a short lesson on the deformation of volume and area under the deformation and we're going to be able to talk about describing those. So, you know, volume of an element and the area normal vector. We'll be able to talk about those and how they transform things from the reference configuration or material configuration to the deformed or spatial configuration, and we'll be able to describe that entirely in terms of the deformation gradient for small areas and volumes. And it's going to follow um, stuff that we already figured out before when we weren't talking about the deformation, just how tensors deform space. So this should be a pretty straightforward lecture for you folks. All right, so let's consider a smooth material surface S in the reference body and a material point S that is in that material surface. Then we're going to let N be a vector that is normal to the surface at X, but not necessarily of unit length. So let's write that all out. <clears throat> Oopsies. Subset of. All right, so like I said, we're going to let n sub r be a vector, not necessarily unit magnitude, normal to S at the point X. <clears throat> so before we worry about scaling, like if we wanted a surface unit normal or a surface area normal, let's start by just taking a vector that is normal to a material surface S and getting a vector that is normal to the deformed surface and then we can worry about scaling later. Well, one thing I, that I ran into here, um, you know, typically I like to make the reference configuration things non-italicized and the spatial configuration ones italicized, subscript T. Um, turns out you can't really write or distinguish while handwriting between a, an italicized or non-italicized letter S. Um, Kind of all comes down to the variability with how you would write S normally, unless you're real consistent, which I'm not, so 
if you don't see a T under it, then it's the reference S, the material one. And if there is a T under it, it's the spatial one here. <clears throat> so ST here is equal to chi T of S. And it is normal to it at X equals chi T reference configuration X. All right, so since F, the deformation gradient, contains all the information needed to describe the local rotation and strain, as we uh, showed in the last lecture, then we expect that we should be able to describe the normal to a surface locally in terms of the original surface normal and F. That's not a good B. Right, that's not too uh, unreasonable an expectation there. In fact, we're going to show that it's a pretty darned reasonable expectation since we're going to do it. But uh, going into it, you can kind of see that coming. <clears throat> okay, so given any material vector TR that's going to be tangent to instead of normal to that material surface S, we know that NR dot TR has to equal zero um, since N is normal to it. Let's write that out in case I was talking gibberish. So we have nr dot tr is equal to scalar 0 for all tr tangent to s at material point x. And we can do something similar in the deformed configuration. If n is normal to st, the deformed surface at a point x equals chi of material point x, which again I'll write. Then n dot t is equal to zero for all t tangent to the spatial configuration of that surface at x. Well, we already know how tangent vectors transform under chi they transform by the deformation gradient. So we know how T 
has to transform, you know, so there has to be a corresponding TR so that T is equal to FTR. So if TR is tangent to the material surface at a point, then T equals F times TR is the corresponding tangent vector to ST at the point in the deformed configuration. like that. All right, so that's, um, you know, tangent vectors in the reference configuration go to tangent vectors in the spatial configuration by F. And, you know, every tangent vector in the spatial configuration has a corresponding reference one that goes by F inverse. Well, because N is normal to ST, we know that N dot T is equal to zero for all vector T tangent to the deformed surface at our point of interest in the spatial configuration. And for each such tangent vector t, there is a corresponding reference configuration tangent vector. So that we have T is equal to F T R and T R whoop, only one there, that's a vector, is equal to F inverse T. All right, well in the reference configuration, N R is normal to the surface in the reference configuration and TR is tangent to it, so NR dot TR has to equal zero. And so we can write TR in terms of T using this one right here. So NR dot F inverse T is equal to zero. We can use the definition of the transpose to say F inverse transpose and R 
dot t is equal to zero. Well, we know that the inverse transpose maps reference configuration vectors to spatial configuration vectors. So this is a spatial configuration vector. And this is satisfied for all t tangent to st at x. So it follows that, um, you know, let's call this n. <clears throat> so n equaling that is normal to st at x um, because it is orthogonal to all tangent vectors to the surface at that point. But it's not necessarily the same magnitude as nr. Um, it gets squished or unsquished depending on the determinant of f and the direction, you know, really based on the principal stretches, if you think about it that way. All right, so that was a little bit of a preview for how we're gonna get the area normal and how areas deform. And I think we actually already did that pretty much in the uh, vector and tensor algebra section, but we'll cover it again because this is definitely the sort of thing you see, need to see more than once. All right, so now we're gonna talk about how volume deforms or changes under the deformation. So let's consider the material parallelepiped. That's a mouthful of a word and even more of something to spell. I'd give it a 50-50 chance of me having spelled it correctly. But we're going to write it down anyway. Um, and it's going to be, it's going to have a corner at x and it's going to be spanned by three material vectors fr, gr, and hr going to do a nice drawing today, which is definitely not something that I'm spectacular at being an engineering student instead of an art student, but you know, we'll give it a shot. Hopefully you'll be able to see what I'm trying to show you, unless the pencil is not going to cooperate now. There we go. I'm never writing that word again, and I'm going to call it volume from here on out. That sounds like a good idea. <clears throat> All right, so it is spanned by the material vectors fr, gr, and hr. So we'll draw that out for you here. Uh, there we go.
All right, so our first vector, and we want to be sure that we pick something that's properly handed here, so. Here's our point X in the reference configuration. This one is FR. This one is GR. And I tried to show using the dotted lines, this one going into the page as opposed to out of it is HR, right? So then in that case, F cross G by the right hand rule, I guess you can't see it because there's not a camera, but I was doing it. Uh, you, you can see that that's aligned with HR, so it's got a, a positive volume. All right, so this whole thing here is our material volume P. And um, the volume of the material region P is equal to fr dot <clears throat> gr cross hr, which we already knew. All right, so as p gets small, you know, so fr, gr, and hr get small. Let's say we pick some sort of scale or epsilon that goes like this, order of the absolute value of epsilon, ooh, that should be just our parentheses right there, is equal to the max order fr, you know, things going to zero faster than any of these, that is. So that's what little o means. Um, which kind of distinguishes it from big O, right? Big O means it's of the same order as, and little o means it's smaller than. So like little o means that if you were to add any of these to, you know, like if you add O, little o F of R to F of R, it's pretty much just F of R. Whereas big O would say that you can't neglect the difference. All right, sort of like that. Um, then, you know, as, as epsilon there gets small, then the deformed volume, scripty P of T, will be basically a parallelopiped, you know. It, um, it could have some squiggliness to it or some non-parallelness of the faces, but it'll be small enough that everything will be within an epsilon distance of being a parallel of piped. P T is equal to chi T of P is basically a then and so the maximum you know linear deviation of any point on one of its faces from being such is going to be order epsilon again, huh? Well, in that case, the volume of the spatial configuration volume there is equal to 
you know, we just deform fr, gr, and hr like tangent vectors, so they go with f. Um, so that's going to be equal to f fr dot f gr cross f hr plus order epsilon cubed. All right, well, that's starting to look pretty determinant E, right? So if we look at the ratio of the spatial configuration or deformed configuration volume to the reference configuration volume, Well, that is equal to, oh man, watch this. We'll get there. It might have ended up taking longer to do this. I'm about three quarters of a second away from giving up. All right, that's it. We're just writing it out. I'm telling you, computers are just man's worst invention ever. They never do what you want them to do. All right, so we're writing the whole thing out again because copy-paste didn't want to work. Which is like, you know, the whole point of using a computer. But anyways. And then that whole thing is plus things that go to zero faster than epsilon cubed. All right, well, that there sure looks to me like it's the expression for the determinant of f. So that is equal to the determinant of f plus order epsilon cubed. So in other words, the ratio of the volume of a small material region in the spatial configuration to its volume in the reference configuration is equal to the determinant of f, which we've given a name the J, the volumetric Jacobian, um, and of course things, and we'll give this, uh, right, so epsilon cubed is going to be the same as the order of the volume of P. All right, so that's how volume goes. In other words, volume of some small region that is materially convecting um, gets scaled by the volumetric Jacobian under the deformation. All right, so now let's look at how areas go. We'll go on to a new page, because why not? So let's let UR and VR define a parallelogram, which we'll also call P. Um, and it's going to have a corner X in the reference configuration. So that the oriented area normal to P at X is AR equals UR cross VR. <clears throat> Actually, since it's a parallelogram, you know, it doesn't even need to be at X. Um, it's just anywhere on it. 
So let's whoop, doo, whoop, whoop, whoop. So we'll draw that, right? We got our point X. We got UR, VR. And we have our little parallelogram P. So under the deformation chi of T, this parallelogram P transforms to an almost parallelogram up to order epsilon in the same exact way as before. Let's center that, that'll be cool. And so here again, the order of epsilon is the maximum of the order <clears throat> of UR order. I guess we should put in some amplitudes there. VR. All right, well, the area normal to the deformed one, um, so let's say. So we'll call this P T, right? So the to the deformed one P T is A is equal to F U R cross F V R plus things that go to zero faster than epsilon squared. <coughs> All right, well, from the definition of the cofactor matrix uh, tensor, this is the cofactor tensor times. UR cross VR is equal to F's cofactor acting on UR cross VR. Plus O, we'll call it AR, which is, of course, order epsilon squared. And so this is F C A R plus things that go to zero faster than A R. Well, we can write that out. Um, A, this, so this is just from what we figured out earlier the cofactor of any tensor is, is equal to the determinant of F F inverse transpose A R plus things that go away faster than A R does. So that's how it is for, you know, a small parallelogram. Most often we'll see it as a differential area element.
So we'll usually see it as the unit vector n hat times the differential scalar area in the spatial configuration is equal to the determinant of f, f inverse transpose times the unit normal in the reference configuration times the differential scalar area in the reference configuration. Now you could go through the whole headache of figuring out how unit normals transform under F. There's going to be some aerial Jacobian stuff that you'll see in this section of the textbook. But really that just becomes an exercise in making sure that the scale factor is equal to one <clears throat> in your direction of interest. Um, that's about it. Okay, so that's going to conclude the lesson for today. Um, this should have all seemed like repeat from the algebra section because it pretty much is, except that now we're saying it specifically for F being the tensor of interest, and we're saying when you kind of zoom in pretty close that it all ends up working out. Um, I had posted a couple examples working out stuff for the homework the other day. Um, hopefully those were helpful to you folks. I gave you until Monday night to turn in homework three. I'm going to post homework four probably tomorrow. Um, and I'll give you guys a few worked out examples to help you along the way for that. Um, let me know if you would like to see those examples done any different way or you know, I'm just kind of writing them out and not running through it in lecture because it seems perhaps more efficient that way than devoting lecture time to it. But, um, you know, it's all up to you whether you find it useful or not. All right. Have a good one. Catch you later.